All right. Well, good morning, First Family Church Bondurant. All right. Uh, we are all lively this morning. That's fantastic. Uh, well, thanks for joining us this morning. To any of our visitors, I think we're all family here, but anybody that would be joining us online, uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, I'm Pastor Mark, uh, lead pastor here at First Family Church, and so glad that you would join us. Uh, by way of announcements, uh, just a couple things. Uh, first of all, there is the um, uh, Women's Progressive Dinner next Saturday. Uh, so that'll be going on. Uh, we do pray for some leftovers at some of the homes <laughs> for anybody who might be randomly hosting for part of that. Um, uh, <clears throat> so that's going on. Uh, second thing is the Operation Christmas Child Boxes. Hopefully you saw those as you were walking in. Uh, you have two weeks, so we'll pick those up on Sunday, uh, two Sundays from now, the November 20th. You're welcome to bring it back if you're ambitious and you get it all put together by next Sunday. That's fine. We'll take it from you next Sunday. But you got this week and next week to pick them up and get them packaged up. And uh, the following Sunday after that, uh, we will deliver them. And uh, the last bit of bad news is, is that unfortunately, this is our last couple days of enjoying the political ads. You know, I always get a, actually I get a chuckle because out of all of the different ways that things get advertised and, buy, and advertising gets purchased, I, I always find a little comical that on in some place in some nook or cranny you'll find on Wednesday you'll find still a leftover political ad that'll run, and I find that a little. Uh, uh, but anyway, praise God that uh, that'll be done on Tuesday, and we can get back to just car commercials and fast food and things like that. So, all right. I think that's all that I've got by way of announcements. Let's spend time in prayer. Heavenly Father and gracious God, thank you. Father, thank you that you've opened up the doors. Thank you that you've uh, given us everything that we need to meet here this morning. Uh, I pray that we would feel your presence in a powerful way. I pray that we would uh, just enjoy, just uh, soak up this time that you are pouring into us Father, I pray that, this, that as you pour into us, that just fuels us as we lift our praises to you in song and in deed. Um, uh, again, thank you that you bless us in so many ways. Uh, we just give you all of the praise for today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll invite everybody to stand up, and we will say our opening scripture, and this comes from Psalm 19. So please... Read along with me. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see the sea. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Good morning, First Family. Let's join in singing praises to the Lord and bringing our prayers before Him. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Thank you. 
think I'm stuck, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Every time I see holy, 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 I go back to Pastor Mark's first message when he was first lead pastor here, that that is how God is. Uh, kind of listening to that song, I don't know, for, for me it's like uh, when Isaiah saw God, holy, 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 his reaction wasn't the, oh, I can hardly wait. It was, oh boy. <laughs> and yet God's reaction to Isaiah's reaction was to send the cherub down to cleanse his lips and to call on him. And uh, so it might be hard, but I think it'd be worth it to see him. Well, we're going to take a brief break to introduce one another. There's a big gap back there, so make sure some of you say hi to the hoaxmas here. I don't know why they don't want to be with you, but uh, we're glad you're here. <laughs> Stay down. All right, well, let's work our way back up here because the good news is we are all rested, except any of you who are parents because kids have no idea what daylight saving time is. Stay down. Stay down. We are going to continue on, however. Uh, God is seen in so many different ways. He is holy, 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 but he is also a good, good father. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that your peace and that I'm never
hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me privilege it is to call you Father. We sit here as your loved children, grateful that uh, you've come to meet us here, grateful that you've pulled us together, grateful that you've saved us through your Son. Father, thank you again for the gift of music. Thank you also for the gift of your Word. I pray that you would uh, meet us here uh, in in an impressive way as we just open up your Word and seek to see your face as you've uh, uh, explained yourself to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You're all welcome to be seated, and the kids are dismissed to their classroom. Well, we are uh, going to be into our continuing in our study and. Uh, the book of Jonah, but as we are going through this series, another piece of what we are covering, another aspect that we're pulling into the service each week is a special highlight of our missionaries. Uh, Jonah is a very missionary-oriented story, and so we want to remember our missionaries. Unlike last week, where we had to be very uh, 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 covert in how we talked about our missionary because she's serving in a very Christian hostile country. Uh, we aren't as restricted with that with the Jensens. And so Andrew and Shannon Jensen are missionaries. In fact, they are the very first missionaries that we as a church financially supported. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting that we were the first church that supported the, the Jensens uh, when they jumped into their when the God called them into uh, their missionary journey. So uh, it's a, we've got a great relationship with them. Uh, one of the things, you know, we've, we've talked about, and again, you know, they're serving in Senegal. Uh, it's, I think, just a very interesting story uh, that uh, here's Andrew, uh, who's a, a civil engineer and, and has that kind of background by trade. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, the engineering community, we are cursed, sorry, blessed with many engineers uh, in our congregation as well. Uh, so, uh, no, no, I love, I love our engineers. But anyway, we, we have a number of folks that could relate to this. They've got that same background. When you think of engineers, you might not think of those that are called, but, but God uses all people with all kinds of skills. Again, our missionary last week uh, has an IT background, and God's using those specific skills uh, to, to, use, you know, to spread the gospel message. Uh, same thing with uh, with engineers. So they play an important role, uh, the Jensen's do, the Engineering Ministries International. Uh, what I think about is uh, th- they help by us providing the funding for EMI uh, for these engineers to go in and do the work. Uh, they are building churches and women's clinics uh, all kind, and school buildings in Senegal and around uh, in that part of Africa. And because of the financial support that we provide, those services come to those countries very, very, very cheap. And so uh, those countries are blessed 
We are providing very frontline uh, blessings to the, the women and children of those countries, uh, again, with the, uh, the buildings that they build. Uh, and so that's just a phenomenal blessing. But likewise, that's also, I kind of think of it as a doorstop. You know, if you think about a door that's, uh, that, that's wanting to close and you push that doorstop open, uh, I, I think of EMI as kind of that doorstop because because they are Christian organization, Christian engineers that come in and do all of this planning and provide a great benefit uh, for, uh, in this case, Senegal and, and some of the other countries around uh, Western Africa. What that does is it is a blessing to those countries, and that holds that door open so that many Christian missionaries can come and serve in Senegal and do not have to hide. Um, there are many countries within Africa where you can't be known as a Christian missionary. Because they will kick you out. At best, they will kick you out. At worst, they will lock you up. Uh, but in, but uh, again, some countries like Senegal uh, are open, are friendly. And again, we provide services. They receive benefits because of Christian services like this. So again, uh, Andrew and Shannon Jensen, if you aren't already signed up for their newsletter, uh, I think we've got a sign up out on the table uh, in the entryway. So please make sure to add that. Please add them to your prayers. Give them a special prayer. Uh, this week. A couple things that uh, were in their most recent uh, uh, newsletter that just came out. Uh, Andrew actually has just been recently promoted, so now he actually oversees uh, many uh, projects going on, not only in Senegal, but in other uh, areas in Western Africa. Uh, so uh, he's jumping up into that role. Uh, likewise, he has been battling uh, some sort of a cold for the last few weeks. Uh, and it's, you know, they've uh, taken to the doctor and all of that stuff, and it's not life-threatening or anything, but it seems like it's really had an impact on him. I know many in our congregation have been dealing with bad colds and things like that, so we can all uh, relate to that. Uh, likewise, uh, Shannon sprained her ankle in some sort of a community contest, the way that it was worded sounds like there's a really good story behind it, but maybe not appropriate for the newsletter. So I'm curious to dig into that with her at some point. So uh, anyway, that's what we've got going on. Let's just uh, spend time in prayer for the Jensen's. Heavenly Father and gracious God, thank you. Father, thank you that uh, you would uh, call on Andrew uh, and others like him that have that really unique skill set uh, of civil engineering, civil planning. Uh, build, you know, planning the, the buildings, the hospitals, the women's clinics, the, uh, the uh, maternity wards, things like that that they've been involved with in very depressed areas uh, in Africa. Uh, I know that there's just frontline, just real humanity, uh, just uh, desperate humanity situations that they've been involved with, that they've helped out, just their, their talents. Uh, you use everybody with all kinds of skill sets, and you call them. And thank you for calling the Jensen's. I do pray uh, that you'd uh, heal Andrew quickly, as well as Shannon, and uh, bless them and their family, and all of those that work with them. Help him as he roll, comes into his new role. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to to serve with them and partner with them. Uh, we just give them uh, a special praise today, and ask for you to give them a special blessing based off of that. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now we are into Jonah. Jonah, it is not about a whale. All right, as you're turning there, uh, my wife and I were married for 10 years before we had kids. And so I knew her quite well as a wife, a wife without kids. And I always curious then when, we, when uh, our uh, son came along, I was curious, I was like, you know, it's... Is she going to be the same wife after kids as she was before kids? Is there anything that's going to change about her? And boy, was I surprised. Uh, the, it wasn't a dimmer switch. It was a light switch. It turned, just instant mom turns on. It was really cool. One of the things that I just, I had a front row seat to see my wife turned from, uh, from wife with no kids to wife with kids, to see the whole mom thing turn on. It was awesome. And so to... One of the things that was just always important to her as the kids uh, grew older, as they celebrated a, a birthday, she always had a big birthday party for the kids. And to see what a mom will do for her kids was just on 
full display. I remember, uh, I think it was when my son turned either six or seven, I think it was one of those, those years, uh, he was really into army-related stuff. And so to see my wife dressed up in camo with face paint, and she had organized an obstacle, obstacle course so that when his friends came over, they did this obstacle course, and I mean, she had the hat, she had everything on. I just remember sitting back with a smile thinking, there is nothing there is nothing that this wonderful woman wouldn't do for her kids. You know, it just, it just, it warmed my heart and, and it's just fun to see that. And one of the things that, that it got, and I thought about that because the theme that we're going to see is that there's nothing that God won't do to reach his loved children. And we're going to see a powerful uh, display of that in our text today. So, If you haven't, uh, hopefully by now you've gotten there. So here we are in Jonah. I'm going to read the whole chapter 1 of Jonah. Verse 1, it says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo uh, that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you... What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come up before us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Verse 8. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And, what are, and, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that, the, that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then he said to them, What shall we do with you? What, the sea, uh, what shall we do with you that the sea may quiet down from us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, that the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that it is because of me that the great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So, From our text today, there's lots of things that we could explore. I'm going to pull out three, uh, what I think, key points uh, that we'll see in our text. Uh, The first one is that our rebellion escalates God's intervention. Our rebellion escalates God's intervention. If you remember uh, last week, we talked about how Jonah was faithful in the call that he had received previously in 2 Kings to go and... um, Uh, provide information to the wicked king, and so he had done that faithfully. So again, we were expecting that Jonah would be also faithful when we come here to this account. And so in the first couple verses, when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, and and the word of the Lord tells Jonah to, to go east to Nineveh, we're expecting Jonah to go east to Nineveh. But instead, we get the but Jonah in verse 3. 
instead of going east, but Jonah goes west. So we see the the first button. That kind of changes the direction pretty quickly, doesn't it? But notice what the first couple words of verse 4 are. So the first couple words of verse 3 are, but Jonah. What's the first couple words of verse 4? But God. So Jonah's going to turn and go west, but God has other plans. And if you stopped right there, if, if we didn't even get the rest of this story, if all that we said, if, if everything else was kind of blacked out at this point, but the Lord, if that's all that you could hear, you, you would probably be able to fill in the rest of the, of the picture and say, okay, something dramatic is going to change here. God's, gonna, God, God's stepping in and going to change the course pretty dramatically. And sure enough, that's exactly what he does. This isn't going to end well for Jonah. And notice the actions of the Lord in our text. In verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And then in verse 7, we read that, uh, that they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Verse 15, they picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased raging. So instantly the sea calmed. And then verse 17, the the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. So God steps up. God takes action. He takes all of this in in a very big way. God was prepared to break up the ship, drown Jonah, all let all the sailors perish. He was ready to do all of that just because of Jonah's rebellion. God can escalate this whole thing far greater than what Jonah can. So is God mean because of this? You know, there were, there were other prophets at the time of Jonah. Could God have just gone to, okay, so Jonah, you're going west, so I'll just find some else. I'll find another prophet to go, to go east to Nineveh. Is that, uh, is that what he should have done? Well, I want you to think about this. Uh, think about it in this way. Uh, imagine that, you know, just a, a little three-year-old kid, imagine just, just grabbing that kid real quickly. You might think that, well, that'd be kind of a, Kind of a, being kind of mean, wouldn't it? But think about it from this perspective. Let's say that you go shopping with your three-year-old. And you go into the grocery store, and you're gonna, you just need to grab a couple things. So you run in real quick. The three-year-old's tagging along. You make the rookie mistake of walking down the candy aisle to get to the bread that you needed to. The rookie mistake, and all of a sudden, the three-year-old sees the aisle of candy. They start reaching... They start reaching, Mom, I want this piece of candy. No, you can't have the piece of candy. Oh, I want the piece of candy. No, you can't have the piece of candy. So the the three-year-old starts getting all mad. So then, in the the frustration, and you say, come over here. What's the three-year-old going to do? Going to go the opposite direction. Because when they start throwing the fit, so the three-year-old starts pulling back, not paying attention to the fact that someone's barreling down the aisle with a shopping cart. And because you love the three-year-old so much, you grab them. Now, it it feels rude to grab them, but it's because of love, because you don't want them to be hit by the shopping cart. And in much the same way, we see God grab Jonah. So, God will make a storm to wreak havoc and to wreck our plans when we readily disobey His commands. If you think about it, what is sin? Sin is rebellion against God. When we sin, we're choosing to follow our own desires, which are contrary to God's desires for us. You know, we, in, ba- in verse 2, we learn that God saw the evil of the people of Nineveh, and God wanted someone to give them a chance to repent away from their sin and rebellion and turn towards Him. And God called Jonah to do just that. But instead... Even more sin entered the picture. When Jonah turns west instead of going east, that's a whole new layer of sin. And is is it loving that a God would just turn his cheek and say, okay, fine, I'll just just let sin run abound? No, a loving God is going to confront evil. We see in 1 John 1, 5 that uh, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is perfect. God is holy. No, 
As our first song mentioned, as John mentioned, God is holy, holy, holy. God is not okay with just a little bit of sin. God is not okay with sin and wickedness. God, it's, it's wonderful. It is wonderful that God hates sin. We want God to hate sin. It's in our best interest, absolutely. If God were to permit, permit Jonah's sin and our sin without reckoning, He would not be holy. We would not... Uh, he would not be able to have free reign against anything and everything. Uh, uh, the commands that the Bible gives us would be mere suggestions, mere moral ideas for us uh, that we could take or leave. William Banks uh, says this. He said, rebellion never escapes God's notice. It's, all, it's foolish for men to think that they can resist God's will with impunity. The Lord may let man go to a certain point before he steps in, but when he does move in, he moves with no uncertainty. God takes a dramatic step when we are in active rebellion against him. If we brush aside the urging from the Holy Spirit to stop sinning, to share the gospel, to choose a righteous versus wicked path, it's good that God brings a reckoning. Yes, We've accepted Jesus as our Savior, but unfortunately, that doesn't instantly, completely erase us of all sin. Sometimes we need that correction, and in fact, we see that in Hebrews 12, 6, for the Lord disciplines the one that He loves. He chastises every son who He receives. You know, we just finished with 1 Peter, and a key message that we saw in 1 Peter was the fact that God brings righteous suffering, but this is a very different lesson. Sometimes the suffering that's in our lives, sometimes it's, there's calamity in our lives because we have rebellion against God in our life. Sometimes the sin that we have in our life brings on suffering. It's a punishment that should change our course of action. It's not punishment just to have punishment. It's punishment so that we would change, so that we would do something different, that we would bring us back. I've mentioned the significance of repeating words that we see in text, and Jonah is full of them. There's, there's more and more that we'll, that we'll get to. But one of the things that we see in here is, you know, our, our text talks about when Jonah goes down to Joppa, when he goes down into the ship, when he laid down and falls fast asleep. So there's this whole down, down, down of Jonah. But on the other hand, in verse 1, God calls, excuse me, in verse 2, God calls Jonah to arise. And likewise, what does the captain of the ship tell Jonah? Rise, get up. So is God calling you to get up out of something? Get up out of the sin that's that's persisting in your life? Are you just dragging yourself down and down and down into sin? And maybe that's the calamity that, that God has brought to bring you up out of that. That's maybe the whole reason for the storm that's in your life. Maybe it's a loving God that's bringing the storm so that you will change and come back. The second point that I want to talk about this morning uh, is a point that I think is not often discussed. You know, I uh, uh, had some fun last week that uh, most people, I think, the average person, the random Christian walking on the sidewalk, if I were to interview them and ask them, tell me what the book of Jonah is about. The first, most people are going to say, make some mention of the whale. Jonah, it's about the whale. Jonah, it's not about the whale. Well, one of the stories that I think, if, if Jonah, uh, excuse me, if the whale gets mistakenly the top billing, oftentimes, what I think is often missed, one of the last things, which I think is, is wrongfully so, is the whole aspect of the sailors. The sailors play an important role in this story. And, and I would love it if somebody came back, next time I randomly asked somebody, what's the, what's the story of Jonah about? If somebody were to come back and say, the, the sailors, I, I, I would be filled with joy at that point. Think about the sailors. 
the next point I'm going to the next point I'm going to mention about this is that it was the sailors' worst and best day. The sailors' worst and best day. So just for a moment, I I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of the sailors. So you work on this cargo ship. Uh, It's just another day. You go to work. Uh, you, You get the cargo. You get a couple people that board on ship. You're doing your job. The ship takes sail. You go off and all of a sudden, you've been a professional sailor for years, and all of a sudden, a storm comes, a storm of literally biblical proportion. A storm comes, and all of a sudden, you are fearing for your life. Now again, if you're a lifelong sailor, you've seen many storms. Likely, rarely, are you worried that you're going to die. But in this case, they were. They were sure that they were going to die. They were calling out They were calling out to God, to their false gods. They were throwing things overboard. They were doing anything because they were convinced that they were going to die. It's uh, uh, they they literally see their life in front, uh, passing before their eyes. I mean, this is a again dramatic storm, something that they had never seen, likely something that would rival. Uh, what the uh, uh, shipwrecked Gilligan skipper and their guests uh, endured on their three-hour tour. Uh, but this is, again, massive storm. Is this, does this mean that God's just a big meanie? I mean, it wasn't the sailors that were running away from God. It was, it was Jonah. One of the passengers comes on board. They didn't ask for this guy. They didn't give him a good deal to help him get away. All that they were doing is they were just doing their job. And Jonah comes on board. And again, it's, it's at this point in time that maybe some would think that maybe God's just a big meanie because these sailors didn't ask for this. As we talked about earlier, sometimes the sin in our lives uh, brings storms upon us. And guess what? Sometimes those storms have other people getting wet. It's not the first time that we see this in Scripture. The sin of David, if you remember that, he, uh, 7,000 people died of pestilence because of David's sin. And all of Israel died because of Achan's sin. So here's the sailors seemingly about to die because of the sin of Jonah. I don't know if you're familiar with the term collateral damage. Collateral damage is a military term. Uh, the idea is, is that uh, a plane is going on a bombing run and they're going to uh, bomb this factory that makes tanks. And as they go on this bombing run, one of the bombs lands in a residential neighborhood and destroys some houses. And they'll call that collateral damage. It's real people that got really hurt, injured, or died, uh, not intentionally. When we rebel against God, He brings the storms in our lives, and guess what? There's often collateral damage. I think a very frequent example of this that we all experience in in our lives is divorce. Many, uh, if you look at the statistics, many have been involved. Probably everybody in this room is impacted either directly or indirectly uh, through divorce. Sin Rebellion against God's plan woven into every divorce that I've ever been familiar with. Often in a divorce, there's sinful acts on both the husband's and the wife's side. Uh, Sometimes it's a 50-50 split. Sometimes it's 80-20. Sometimes it's 99-1. But rarely have I ever seen a situation where it's 100 and 0. But nonetheless, the, the marriage dissolves. And what's the collateral damage? The kids. You know, uh, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, the, there was a very public announcement of Tom Brady getting a divorce. And I am no Tom Brady fan, but I was really sad about that. that and, and it's not that I, I was sad because not that I'm a Tom Brady fan, but I'm a big fan of marriage. And, and why am I a big fan of marriage? Because God's a big fan of marriage. And so I'm rooting for the marriage. God's rooting for marriage. And it just and, and tears me up to see that. And you got kids that are going to be uh, dramatically impacted by this. 
So here we are, back to our story. So we see that these sailors look like there may be going to be this collateral damage in this whole storm, in this whole event, because of Jonah's resistance, rebellion against God. But notice the actions of the sailors. They clearly, they clearly aren't Jews. When the storm hits and the ship's about to sink, if you look at excuse me, verse 5, the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God. And then, uh, did they get any answer, of course, from the false gods? No. But then, look in verse 6. What does the captain yell? So the captain came to him. What do you mean, you sleep or rise? Call out to your God. The captain is calling Jonah to call out to God. And what does Jonah do? What, what record do we have of Jonah after the, after the captain comes to Jonah and says, call out to your God? Crickets. We don't see Jonah calling out to the Lord. We see the captain telling Jonah, call out to the Lord. We don't see Jonah doing that, do we? The sailors, they had the right actions. They were wanting, they were calling out. They knew that they needed help from, from a God. They just didn't know who the right God was. Their faith was misplaced. But they sincerely needed and desired salvation. The sailors cast lots. They figured out that it was Jonah's fault. Then they asked him a whole bazillion questions. If you think about it, here's the perfect opportunity for Jonah to share the gospel. You've got a captive audience. They know that they're about to die. They have exhausted all of their false gods. And they're like, who are you? Where are you from? You would think that this would be the most open door. This would be the time for Jonah just to step up. Let me tell you about the one true God. And what we get, we get kind of a Kind of a half-hearted explanation from Jonah. Not, not the, we, there are many other texts in Scripture that I could point you to that were, fun, that were awesome uh, displays of preaching the gospel message. Jonah's is not that impressive. Jonah gives the bare-bones facts about who the one true God is. So, in spite of Jonah not bringing the heat. He does the bare minimum in, in what I can, I can see. In spite of all of that, how did the sailors respond? In verse 10, the sailors were exceedingly afraid. The sailors start off afraid of the storm, but here's where the pivot is. They start off afraid of the storm, but now all of a sudden they're afraid of God. And Jonah tells the sailors just to throw him overboard. And we see them call out for the very first time in verse 14. The sailors who had been calling out to false gods in verse 14. Therefore, they called out, the sailors called out to the Lord, to Yahweh. The, o Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and laid not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. For the first time ever, these sailors are calling on the true God, the true God that can offer them salvation. The sailors cry out to the Lord, save us. They throw Jonah overboard, and the sea instantly calms. And what's the last that we hear of the sailors? Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. The sailors met God. The sailors who were clearly worshiping other false gods, that were not worshiping the one true God, were in the middle of the storm, they were about to die. And through all of this, these sailors came to know the true God. What an amazing piece. What an amazing story. Again, in they woke up that morning, they were just going to work, they were living their normal life as pagans worshiping false gods. After the ship set sail, a storm 
more horrific storm than they had ever had. And after that storm, they would end up right with God. Now, I also think it's interesting because we know all the rest of the story. We know what happens to Jonah. If you were a sailor on that ship, the last you would have seen is you threw him over. You would have assumed that he died. You would never know that he actually got to Nineveh. You, ne- you never knew anything about what the rest of the story was. I, uh, one day uh, in heaven, I would, I would love to sit down and chat with the sailors, hear more about their story. I bet they're shocked, like, whoa, that happened? I mean, from their perspective, what an amazing experience that this was. So what do you think the sailors thought of the storm? The storm that almost ended their lives? That same storm pointed us to the one true God of the universe. That was a life-changing storm for them in many ways. Are you or someone around you in the middle of a storm? Give them the gospel. I've seen this far too many times. It's now just a a knee-jerk reaction to me. When somebody comes up to me and shares the calamity that they're in, and this problem just happened, and and this dire situation is just happening, and uh, they go through the list, the first thing that that just comes to my mind is, is that how is God using this to reach you in some way? Have you prayed? Have you called out to God? Is there, is there a sin in your life that you, need to, uh, that you need to fix? Maybe you're this part of the collateral damage. Maybe this is just an opportunity for you to get closer to the Lord yourself. But you could be those sailors. That, again, maybe it's, it's a calamity. I've seen many examples of this happen in, in my lifetime, that people that were walking away from the Lord, and again, the storm comes, and And in the end, it was through that storm that they are pointed back to God. And now we come to our third and final point that I'm going to pull out of the text, and that is is that a sacrifice was required. If you remember last week, I mentioned how uh, Jesus referenced Jonah, uh, and I talked about this in, in Matthew 12, 40. That for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But today, I want you to consider there's a second reference that Jesus made to Jonah, and that is a little bit later in Matthew 16, uh, where he says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except for the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. So what's a sign? Now, I know my audience, and I know that you guys love going into work on Mondays and being able to impress your coworkers with some good theology. And this is a really good one. This is a really good one. So, a sign. Back in the day, we used to use maps to get from one place to another. So we would just have to know kind of where we were, and then we would see that there was an exit off of the freeway, and then when we saw the sign, then we would pull off. Well, nowadays, on your fancy GPS, it shows you uh, a picture of the lanes and which one to take, which I think is pretty cool. That's helpful. So uh, it's, but even that... That is a sign. It looks very much like, but it's not exactly the actual turnoff. It shows you very much what the turnoff is going to look like. It's just not the actual one. And so it's just something for you to follow. That's the sign that you follow. That's the GPS that you follow. Well, this sign, uh, what in theological terms, we call this a type, a type. And so there's all kinds of types that we read or signs that we read in Scripture. I'll give you just one quick example. A quick example of this would be the ark, if you remember the story of Noah and the ark. And the ark itself is a type of Jesus, or it's a sign that points towards Jesus. So the ark, for the few people that loaded up inside, the ark was provided by God, the few people that were, listened to God and followed and, and 
got themselves into the ark. If you were inside the ark, you were safe. You're safe from the wrath of God. If you were outside of the ark, you were not safe. You were destroyed by the wrath of God. Again, that's a, in a small way that kind of points forward to Jesus. Jesus, the new ark, the perfect ark. Uh, that inside Jesus, we are all safe from the wrath of God. Outside, we are not. So just, again, I could go through, there's many different types or signs or examples that we could go through uh, from the Old Testament. But I think one of the things that's interesting to think about then in the text that we're in is to think about in which ways do we see Jonah as a sign or as a type of Jesus. So think about from this perspective. Both Jonah and Jesus were from the region of Galilee. Both preached God's message of judgment and reconciliation to sinners. Both both were fast asleep at some point during a violent storm at sea. Both sacrificed themselves to save others. Jonah entered the jaws of the whale while Jesus entered the jaws of the grave. Both were kept for three days. Both were raised by the Father. So we see that Jonah, of course, is an imperfect version of all of these. Where Jonah falls short, Jesus overflows. But if you think about it, the sailors couldn't save themselves. The sailors couldn't save themselves. They had to throw the prophet overboard. Lord pours out his wrath on the prophet, and he dies to and for the sailors. But he's found alive to and for God. How about you? Are you like the sailors? Are you trying to save yourself? The prophet Jesus is right there, ready to be thrown over for you. He's he's the ready, willing sacrifice for you. He's the only thing that can calm the storm. In spite of all of the things that you might throw overboard, all of the actions that you might take, there's nothing that the sailors could have done themselves to have stopped the stormy sea. They couldn't have saved themselves. They needed a sacrifice. They needed a prophet sacrifice. And so do we. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jonah was the sacrifice for that moment and that time for that small group. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. We're all on a sinking ship, sure to perish. Jesus is our prophet who is ready, who is willing to be sacrificed to save us from certain death. You know, the greatest picture that we have, again, I I go back to my uh, first illustration, you know, the greatest picture that I know of, of someone that's willing to do anything for their kids is to see my wife do that. But even she can't sacrifice her own child. It wouldn't have done anything. And yet that's exactly what God did. God demonstrates a greater love, a greater sacrifice than anything that we could ever imagine or offer ourselves. That wraps up with our take-home verse and our take-home truth, and that is a loving God will use unexpected means to accomplish His plan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, thank You. Father, thank you that you will not let go. Father, I am grateful for the relentless love that you have for us, that you would pursue us, that you would not let us stay in our rebellious uh, paths. Father, thank you ultimately that you would provide the prophet to save us, the innocent to save the guilty. Father, thank you. I, I I pray that we're all just reminded of this today. If there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that's trying to save themselves, I pray that you are softening their hearts, that are opening their minds, helping them see that they are in need of a Savior. 
that Jesus, the innocent prophet, has given his life to save them. And they just need to accept it. They need to accept his sacrifice instead of their own work. What a great reminder to us that our faith and trust is only in him and him alone. To you be the glory, Father. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And it's at this time that we will enjoy communion. Uh, If you have not already, the elements are there to the table on your left. Grab those, and in just one minute, we'll all partake together. I don't think he meant to, but Pastor Mark got me thinking about biblical political ads. And this says I'm on. Am I on? Do you think I'm on? You think I'm off. I know that. Uh, But I was thinking, you know, when you hear the political ads, too extreme, too this, you know, and, and both parties are too extreme for Iowa, you know, and both candidates are not good for us and all of this kind of things. And I'm thinking about what Pastor Mark was preaching on this morning. And here we have Jonah running away from God. And sometimes the temptation might even be to say, you know, for Satan to sneak in, because what was Satan's first approach? Did God really say? Did God really do? And here he's saying, you know what? Those poor sailors, they didn't ask for this. Look what's going to happen to them. Isn't this terrible? And I love what Pastor Mark brought out. It was the best day of their lives. This is the God we serve. Because not a single person on that ship was unknown. Satan would like to tell us otherwise. There was a time when Moses, after some difficult things were happening with the people of Israel, which is almost a repetitious redundancy, isn't it, you know, for him? He said, God, what I really want to do is I, I want to see you, like we sang in the first song. He was in a slightly different situation than Isaiah. And God said, you can't see my face because you can't live. It's too much for you by you and I'll show you as I pass by who I am. And I want you to listen to see God's, I say this cautiously, God's political ad about himself. What God wants us to know about God. Exodus chapter 34. Then the Lord passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow down to the earth and worship statement that God made about who am I is, of course, Jesus coming and becoming flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And so we gather together for communion each Sunday, and we remind ourselves that all that God put toward us to draw us back to Him, He ultimately sends his son Jesus and says, this is the way. As Pastor Mark said in his message, there has to be a sacrifice. We cannot save ourselves. No matter what turmoil, no matter what storms, we have to look to God and God alone. And we have to look to the cross. And so on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took this bread that had been a sign of his coming in the Passover. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this bread that you've been eating for the Passover, this is actually my took 
the cup. And he passed it around to his disciples. He said, this cup is not the cup of the old covenant, which was a sign, but of the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink together. Father, I thank you that you have given sign after sign after sign, pointing us to the reality of Jesus. Whether it's in the bread and the cup, whether it's in Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale or the big fish. We don't have altar calls physically here in this church, but we do with this song, Come to the Altar.
best way to tell the world of the treasure. Obviously, our own story, our own testimony. Maybe we were one of those sailors in a life that God was dealing with somewhere else, and we thought we were collateral damage, but God changed our lives. That's a story to tell. But knowing the full story comes from knowing the Word of God, and so our closing benediction encourages us. Let's say this together as we leave today. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We are dismissed to go and tell.